I think it's time that we start teaching people about spiritual warfare the right way. Because oftentimes, whenever we think about this idea of spiritual warfare, we visualize somebody in their prayer closet, uh, casting out demons, rebuking the devil, binding and loosing things, and doing all this different craziness that the Bible really doesn't talk about as it relates to spiritual warfare. And so what I want to do in this video is I really want to set the record straight. And I want to look at what the Bible truly says about spiritual warfare. And I believe that there are seven things, seven weapons that God has mandated. He gives us in the word of God in Ephesians chapter six, verses 10 through 18, where he says, hey, if you really want to be serious about spiritual warfare, it's not about all that stuff that you see people doing on TV, laying hands and all that stuff. That might be part of it. But the reality is if you want to engage the enemy in spiritual warfare, he gives you seven tools. And the first weapon is truth. Notice that Paul says, put on the belt of truth. Listen, you can go back to the garden and you can see that it's very clear that the enemy's plan against you and I is to deceive us, to deceive us, which basically means that he's trying to convince you and I that the things that God says are evil are actually okay for us to indulge in. And the way of righteousness isn't something that you should do, right? He's trying to deceive you into false teachings that are being permeated all throughout the church or even outside the church. And he's also trying to deceive us into false thinking, thinking about yourself, that you're less than, that you're this or you're that. And so the more you and I are girded up in God's truth, the less susceptible we'll be to the enemy's deception and his tactics to try to deceive us from what God says is true as it relates to what he wants you to believe. Now, the second weapon that we need to use against the enemy in spiritual warfare is not only truth, but he says righteousness. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. And the idea here is this. There's two different types of righteousness in the Bible. The first is what's called positional righteousness, which is the idea that we have a right relationship with God now through Christ. But then there's another relationship uh, or righteousness rather, which is basically right living. And so the idea is this, it's very simple. If you and I have a practice of right living, we will avoid just by default many of the snares and the attacks of the enemy, many of the pitfalls that he wants to for you and I to fall into. If we just live right, we will naturally bypass many of those things. For instance, if you don't fornicate before marriage and you're never going to get somebody pregnant and you're never going to get a disease, do you see what I'm saying? If you don't get drunk, you're never going to wreck because of drunk driving. If you don't, uh, I don't know, carry drugs on you or something like that, you're never probably going to get arrested for having drugs and then spending time in jail, right? So like if you just live right, you can avoid many of the pitfalls that the enemy wants to set before you. The third weapon is peace. He says, hey, put on the shoes that are prepared for the gospel of peace. Now, peace in the Bible has many different uh, possibilities. You can have peace with God, and we have that now because God is no longer angry at you. He took all of his anger out on the Lord Jesus Christ, his son, so that you can have peace with God, knowing that even if you make mistakes, even if you fall, God is not angry with you anymore, right? But also the peace of God. And that's the idea that whenever you're living right and you're in God's will for your life, it will be accompanied by peace with peace of God. Meaning God's going to give you that assurance that you're right where he wants you to be. And then finally, there's peace with others. And this is the idea that whenever you and I are peacemakers and we are proactive in creating peace in our relationships, we're in the will of God. So my friend, when the enemy tries to come against your mind, when the enemy tries to get you out of the will of God, or when the enemy tries to create havoc in your relationships, you can war against him by achieving that peace that passes all understanding that God wants you to have. Weapon number four is the weapon of faith. He says, take up the shield of faith. And so the idea here is pretty obvious. When the enemy tries to come against you with fear, 
to where you are afraid of moving forward because you are operating in a place of fear and you're not claiming the promises of God on your life. See, the enemy's job is to try to stagnate you and to hold you back and to hinder you from moving forward in God's purpose for your life. And one of the main ways he does that is to keep you in a place of fear to where you're afraid of getting married. You're afraid of starting that business. You're afraid of starting that ministry. You're afraid of doing all these things because you don't know what's ahead. But whenever you put that shield of faith out there, you can accomplish the things, not just that you name it and claim it, but the things that you know in your mind and your heart and your soul that God has already put in your spirit to do. You have the courage to walk those things out in faith. Number five is the helmet of salvation. Check this out. The enemy wants to attack your mind. He wants to cause you to think that you are not saved. He wants to cause you to think that God doesn't love you. He wants to cause you to think that God is angry with you or that God is disappointed in you whenever you fail him. He wants to cause you to think that you've lost your salvation or that you're no longer a child of God. And if you have a proper understanding of your salvation, if you have proper theology about how you get saved, and who was responsible for your salvation? And all that goes into the idea and the concept of, the, of, of your, uh, your salvation, it can protect your mind from all sorts of negative thoughts and doubts that the enemy wants to plant in your mind to cause you to go crazy. So we're in your mind, it's like a tornado, right? This is why theology is so important for you to understand what the Bible says about your salvation. Number six is the sword of the spirit or the word of God, as Paul says here. And the idea here is this, guys, that when you and I study the word of God, as boring as it may seem at times, what you are doing is you are taking God's thoughts and you're putting them in your spirit. You're depositing them in your spirit so that at some later time that you may not even be aware of, the Holy Spirit who lives in you will then extract whatever spiritual principles or scriptures that you have previously placed in your spirit, he will pull those out at the appropriate time so that whenever you're making decisions, whenever you are faced with temptation, whenever you have that mountain in front of you, you will not have to make decisions and face temptation based on the world's standards and the world's perspective. No, no, no. You will at any given time have God's perspective because you have put the word of God in your spirit. You've hidden the word of God in your heart so that way the Holy Spirit can bring that out and bring it up to your remembrance in the exact time so that way when the enemy tries to trip you up your first line of defense will be what does the word of God say and what does God have to say about this and then the seventh weapon of spiritual warfare is none other than prayer but listen not just any prayer right but praying according to the will of God praying in the spirit praying with the power of the spirit or according to the spirit. So whenever we pray, whenever we fast, whenever we seek God's face, we are doing damage in the heavenly realms. We are doing things. We're accomplishing things and, and fighting against uh, the, the powers of this world and the, the cosmic darknesses of this world. We're doing damage on our knees and things are being accomplished on our knees that could never be accomplished if we try to do it in our own strength. So my friend, listen, I know that you've probably been taught a whole lot about spiritual warfare, but the reality is that it's plain. In this text, he tells you exactly what you need to do in order to war against the devil. And I encourage you to put these seven weapons, the Bible says that we should take up the full armor of God every single day. Because you never know whenever you're going to have to engage in spiritual warfare. And every single one of these weapons has a different purpose, which is the reason why you have to have the full armor of God on at all times. So, my friend, I would love to hear your thoughts. What do you think about spiritual warfare? Are you going through spiritual warfare right now? Have you heard it taught differently? Let me know in the comment section below. If you found this video helpful in any way, feel free to share it with a friend. Also, if you haven't done so already, I would love it if you would subscribe. Check out some of the other videos on this channel. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time on The Beat.